John Bush. I'm an emergency physician and a snake bite specialist. I'm from Loma Linda University Medical Center, and I'm here to talk to you about treating a patient with a snake bite using Crofab antivenom. Snake bite is a particularly challenging problem because of the wide variety of toxic effects. A person can present with little more than a fang puncture wound, or they can develop multi-system failure and death. Unfortunately, it's difficult to predict which patients will have relatively mild symptoms and which will go on to develop a rapidly progressive and potentially fatal envenomation syndrome. That's why I recommend that if anyone's bitten by a venomous snake, they should go immediately to emergency medical care. And the quickest way to do this is by calling 911. Factors that reduce mortality the most in the United States are anti-venom, intensive care, and rapid transport. Paramedics should transport the snake-bitten patient as rapidly as possible. One way that venom injures human tissue is by digesting it. The longer that the venom has time to work, the more tissue gets damaged. So time is tissue. The sooner that anti-venom can be started, the sooner that irreversible injury can be prevented. Hey, what happened? Make sure your receiving facility has an adequate supply of Profab. All hospitals should stock at least enough antivenom to treat one patient. Remove jewelry and tight-fitting clothing in anticipation of severe swelling. Mark the leading edge of swelling with a pen and write the time alongside. Repeat this as swelling advances. Supportive measures like oxygen, intravenous lines, airway support, and ACLS protocols should be provided as needed. All patients with snake bites should have an intravenous line started and a normal saline fluids bolus given. We'll start an IV. I'll give you some medicines for pain for the nausea and a little bit of something to help before they get stuck in the hands like that. Despite what you might have learned in Boy Scout, the decision to cross fang marks and mouth suction are no longer recommended. Suction devices are ineffective and can injure your patient. Arterial tourniquets are not recommended. Lymphatic constriction bands and pressure mobilization techniques, that is, a splint plus an ace wrap, may inhibit the spread of venom if properly applied, possibly even delaying death after a potentially fatal envenomation. However, limiting venom spread could be harmful after a pit viper envenomation if it increases local necrosis or compartment pressure. Other field interventions that don't work or add insult to injury include electric shock, placing ice directly on the wound, or drinking alcohol. If you're uncertain about whether a particular snake is venomous or not, consider taking pictures of it with a digital or Polaroid camera from a safe distance of at least six feet away. But I don't recommend paramedical personnel capture or kill the snake. It's not a good idea to transport the snake for obvious safety concerns. Profab is indicated for pit viper intimidation. And by pit vipers, I mean rattlesnakes, cottonmouths or water moccasins, and copperheads. It's not indicated for coral snake or non-venomous snake bite. Crofab is made using the venom of four different species of snakes. The eastern diamondback rattlesnake, the western diamondback rattlesnake, the mojave rattlesnake, and the cottonmouth or water moccasin. These species were used to ensure that Crofab would be protective against any species of North American pit viper. Pit vipers have a characteristic look. All pit vipers have a triangular head, elliptical pupils, and a heat sensing pit between the eye and nostril. Rattlesnakes are easiest to identify because they have a rattle. The single rattle of a baby rattlesnake is silent, but the tail does not taper off. If the rattle has been damaged, the tail is blunt. Copperheads and cottonmouths do not have a rattle, but do have a single row of scales beneath their tail. Non-venomous snakes generally have divided scales beneath their tail. Venom is obtained from snakes under laboratory conditions. Then Crofab is made by immunizing sheep with the snake's venom, obtaining the resulting immunoglobulins from the sheep, and isolating the active portion, which is called the fab fragment. Historically, many patients with copperhead bites and didn't get treated with anti-venom. Copperhead envenomations tend to be milder than your average rattlesnake bite, but permanent disability and serious sequela can still develop. Because of its safety profile, doctors are more likely to treat patients with copperhead envenomations with Crofab.
my name is Amy Savarino, and I'm here to teach you about the nursing aspects of treating a snake bite victim that's entered your ER. Nursing care is very important to the management of these patients. Watching for reaction and reoccurrence is key. First, you should place oxygen and monitors on the patient. Check vital signs immediately and every few minutes until the patient is stabilized. Start a second intravenous line and make sure that a fluid bolus is given. Then draw blood for labs. Remove any jewelry or tight-fitting clothing in anticipation of extreme swelling. Maintain the extremity in a neutral position, not elevated or below the level of the heart. Ask the patient if he or she is allergic to papaya, papain, or sheep. Also ask if the patient has received antivenom in the past. Previous exposure and even allergy are not absolute contraindications to receiving Crofab. Just because a person has a sensitivity to wool does not mean that they will have an allergy to Crofab, even though Crofab comes from sheep serum. However, the risks, benefits, and alternatives will have to be considered before proceeding with the antivenom. Next, you should measure the degree of swelling. Measure from the most distal vein mark to the leading edge of advancing edema. Mark the leading edge with a permanent marker and write the time alongside. Document your measurement in your notes. Repeat this measurement often enough to gauge progression. Measure every 15 to 20 minutes initially. Once Crofab is started, measurements should be followed every one to two hours. Perform a complete physical exam. Examine the wounds. If there's only faint punctures and no other signs of envenomation, that's called a dry bite. The patient should be observed for at least eight hours to make sure that symptoms don't develop. Update tetanus vaccination as needed. Patients with snake bites can develop rhabdomyolysis, which usually responds to aggressive fluid hydration, but can require dialysis if myoglobinuric renal failure develops. Snake bite can cause severe swelling, bruising, and blistering check for compartment syndrome. A compartment syndrome happens when the pressure inside the muscle compartment exceeds the blood pressure and therefore exceeds the perfusion pressure. Consider involving a hand surgeon or similar specialist if a compartment syndrome is suspected. Snake bite can also cause coagulopathy and systemic effects such as hypotension, lethargy, or vomiting. Myokymia, also known as fasciculations, is a type of venom-induced muscle twitching. Certain snake bites can cause neurotoxicity, so perform a complete neurological exam. For example, look for ptosis, check for motor weakness. Propab should be stored at two to eight degrees centigrade. The usual starting dose is four to six vials. Each vial should be reconstituted with 10 milliliters of sterile water. Crofab takes a few minutes to go into solution. We can usually get it dissolved in less than 10 minutes, but others have reported it's taken as long as half an hour. It's not quite in solution yet, but it's getting there. If the decision is made to definitely treat with Crofab, some facilities like ours start mixing the Crofab before the patient arrives at the hospital. Remember, time is tissue. Crofab should be swirled are rolled between your hands, not shaken. Once Crofab goes into solution, the vial should be further diluted in a 250 milliliter bag of normal saline. I suggest removing 40 to 60 milliliters of the saline from the bag. Then inject the contents of the vial into the bag. No skin test is needed. Start the infusion slowly at a rate of 50 cc's per hour for the first 10 minutes. A physician skilled in resuscitation should be at the bedside. Difficult airway equipment and epinephrine should be immediately available. Diphenhydramine and an H2 blocker such as cimetidine should also be ready. As the infusion is initiated, watch for signs of adverse reactions. For example, look at the skin for urticaria and flushing. Look in the oral pharynx for angioedema. Listen for stridor. Listen to the lungs for wheezing. Watch the vital signs for a sudden drop in blood pressure. If the infusion is tolerated for the first 10 minutes, the rate should be increased for a total volume of 250 milliliters in an hour. If there's a problem at any time, stop the infusion, treat the reaction accordingly, and reassess the need to continue the antivenom.
A physician should be nearby at all times during the remainder of the infusions. Crofab is pregnancy category C. Its effects on the fetus are unknown. Crofab should be given to a pregnant woman only if clearly needed. However, snakebite has been reported to cause spontaneous abortion. If the decision has been made to administer antivenom, Crofab should be given to pregnant patients using the same treatment guidelines as for any other patients. Crofab contains mercury, which in high doses can cause nerve and kidney toxicities in developing fetuses and small children. The dose is the same for children and adults. It's not weight-based. An initial dose of Crofab is four to six vials, and that dose is repeated until initial control is achieved. That is, there's no further advancement of the swelling, the coagulopathy starts to improve, and the systemic effects start to resolve. After initial control is achieved, a maintenance dose is given. And a maintenance dose is two vials every six hours for a total of three doses to reduce the chance that recurrence phenomenon will develop. Local recurrence is the redevelopment of progressive swelling after initial control is achieved. For local recurrence, an additional two vials of Crofab should be given as soon as progressive swelling recurs. Coagulopathy recurrence is the redevelopment of an abnormal coagulation parameter after initial control. For coagulopathy recurrence, indications for an additional two vials of Crofab are abnormal bleeding, fibrinogen less than 50, platelet count less than 25, INR greater than 3, multi-component coagulopathy, worsening trend in a patient with prior severe coagulopathy, and high-risk behavior for trauma or comorbid conditions that increase bleeding risk. Coagulopathy recurrence can develop as late as two weeks after a snake bite. Snake bite commonly results in thrombocytopenia and defibrination. Therefore, I recommend certain labs be drawn. I recommend a CBC with platelets, PT, PTT, and a fibrinogen for starters. Labs will need to be repeated after Crofab is given to monitor treatment efficacy. A patient's lab test may need to be followed up periodically after an envenomation. Patients with snake bites often require pain management, and I recommend an opiate analgesic such as morphine, taking care to keep an eye on the respiratory rate and the blood pressure. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen and aspirin should be avoided for two weeks after a rattlesnake bite because they could contribute to venom-induced coagulopathies. Serum sickness is a possible complication of antivenom therapy and can occur up to three weeks after treatment with antivenom. Serum sickness may manifest with a fever, itchy rash, swollen lymph nodes, or joint pain. Serum sickness can usually be treated on an outpatient basis with diphenhydramine and steroids. If there are any signs of envenomation, and even if the envenomation is mild, I recommend treating with Profab. Don't wait till it gets worse. Permanent injury could result. Upon discharge, instruct the patient to watch for any abnormal bleeding, easy bruising, or petechiae. No contact sports, elective surgery, or dental work for two weeks. Have the patient watch for signs of infection. Surgical referral as appropriate is suggested. Skin grafting is sometimes necessary. Also, refer the patient to a physical therapist as needed. To prevent snake bites, keep your property free of debris such as this log pile. Remove bird feeders. The fallen seeds attract rodents, which attract snakes. Wear boots or protective clothing when in the wilderness. Never handle a rattlesnake, even if you believe it's dead. If you accidentally step too near to a venomous snake, take two giant strides back. This should get you out of the snake's strike range. If you have questions about any aspect of snake bite treatment, I would encourage you to get help from a specialist, such as those available at the Poison Control Center. Close follow-up is recommended for two to three weeks after the envenomation. We weren't able to give you all the details in the video. So please make sure and read the package insert. I hope you found the information in this video useful. I've had excellent results with Crofab and believe you will too. Good luck treating your next patient with a snake bite.